Shift Show. Well, it is Good Friday today, and most of the world's markets are closed, including the U.S. stock market. And by the way, let me wish everybody who celebrates uh, Good Friday and uh, Easter uh, happy uh, Good Friday and Easter. And of course, uh, to all my Jewish listeners, uh, happy Passover. But let me uh, get to the economic data that came out this morning, because apparently some of the government offices are open today. They're actually working and they're putting out economic data. Of course, most of it is bad. Uh, Let me start with the consumer price index, which isn't bad from my perspective, but it's going to be bad, at least from Wall Street's perspective or from the Fed's perspective. Although bad is good in that it will give them cover not to raise rates or you know to dial back the rate hikes because the CPI actually dropped in March by three tenths of a percent. It was unexpected. It was supposed to be flat, and the core the core number was supposed to be up 0.2. It was down 0.1, and I think this is the weakest uh, inflation number in a couple of years. Of course, year over year. We're still above the Fed's 2% target. Year over year, CPI headline up 2.4, and the core uh, is up 2.0. But the most recent number being down is what may, in fact, motivate the Fed or give the Fed cover to uh, walk back the uh, expectations that the market now has with respect to two or three rate hikes coming later this year. But I think the more relevant information is the extremely weak number we got on retail sales. Now, I was expecting a weak number. I mentioned that on my last podcast, and we got a weak number. But not only was it weak, but they revised the February number that was originally weak, and they made it a whole lot weaker. So the expectation was for a flat month of March for retail sales versus the 0.1% gain that we eked out in February. Well, now the... Uh, government came back and said, no, the February number was actually a drop of 0.3. So instead of up 0.1, we dropped 0.3. And in March, instead of being flat, we were down another 0.2. So that means for the two months combined, we have a decline of 0.5% instead of an increase of 0.1, which is what everybody was looking for. Now, if you take out autos, the numbers were just as bad or almost as bad Uh, They revised the prior month from up 0.2 to zero, and the consensus for this month was up 0.2, and that came out as zero. And if you take out gasoline as well, they took last month's down from up 0.2 to up 0.1, and this month, instead of up 0.3, we got an up 0.1. So very, very weak numbers. In fact, after the numbers came out, the Atlanta Fed reduced again their estimate for Q1 GDP down to 0.5 from 0.6. Now, I actually was expecting a little bit of a bigger downward revision, but I guess we'll have to wait till next week for that. But remember, Atlanta Fed was looking for 3.4% for the first quarter as late as February 1st. This is mid-April, and now they're down to 0.5%. That is almost three full percentage points below what the Fed was looking at. In fact, I read this article on Zero Hedge. The Fed raised interest rates. So if the GDP actually comes out at 0.5, if it matches the Atlanta Fed's expectations, this will be the weakest quarter of GDP growth in like 35 or 37 years, something like that, in which the Fed raised rates. You'd have to go back to the early 1980s. And of course, that's when we had... You know, the stagflation, that's when Ronald Reagan came in and, you know, we're trying to stamp out uh, the inflation. And so the Fed is raising rates, even though the economy is weak. And so this would be the first time they've done that since then. And of course, I've been pointing this out. The Fed is supposedly raising rates data dependent. Well, the data is awful. right? So why are they raising rates if they're data dependent? When the data they depend on would suggest that they don't raise rates. And again, I've given all sorts of explanations for this. They're just trying to drum up confidence. 
They're just trying to jack rates up a little bit so they have more to drop them in the next recession. There's all sorts of reasons. But now, you know, you've got Donald Trump out there entering the fray, number one, dangling a carrot in front of Janet Yellen. Because remember, when Trump was running for president, Right? He was extremely critical of Janet Yellen. I mean, just like he was talking about the big, fat, ugly bubble, he was blaming Yellen for inflating the big, fat, ugly bubble. Remember, he said Yellen is being political. Yellen is deliberately keeping interest rates artificially low. She's trying to help Hillary Clinton. Right? He was very critical of Janet Yellen. He was going to replace her. Remember, he was going to replace Janet Yellen, just like he was going to replace Obamacare. Well, it looks like he's 0 for 2 when it comes to replacing stuff, because Obamacare is not going to get replaced. And now it looks like Janet Yellen's not going to get replaced either, because he was asked in an interview, you know, if she were toast. And he said no. In fact, he said all sorts of uh, flattering things about Janet Yellen. So um, it's amazing what a difference an election could make. Right. She goes from public enemy number one, uh, you know, to his favorite person. Uh, and Obviously, now, Janet Yellen, who wants to get reappointed because she's got a very cushy job there as Fed chairman, and she wants to be reappointed, now she knows that it's possible. All she has to do is play ball, right? And what does Donald Trump want? What's the ball game? Low rates. He reiterated the fact that he is a low interest rate guy. Of course, the guy is levered up. He owns real estate. He wants interest rates to stay low personally. Right. He personally profits from low interest rates because he has a vested interest in propping up uh, real estate prices. And so he's talking again how he wants low interest rates. And what he doesn't want is a recession to happen, you know, early in his presidency because he's already taken credit for all the good stuff that's happening. And so now he's going to get stuck with the blame for any bad things that happens. And so he wants Janet Yellen to help avoid that to help postpone any of that kind of pain. And so now he's saying, hey, you know, you could be reappointed. It's not a lost cause. Do your job. You know, don't plunge the economy into recession. Don't keep raising rates in the face of all this weak economic data. That's really the message that uh, Trump is sending to uh, Janet Yellen. And by the way, he also mentioned in the same interview that he thinks the dollar is too strong and, you know, he, he thinks it's a problem. And the funny part about it is, is he took credit for the strong dollar. He said, you know, part of that is my fault because everybody has so much confidence in me. And, you know, the dollar hasn't really moved up very much uh, since, uh, since he was elected. In fact, the Japanese yen right now is trading at a five-month high against, uh, against the U.S. dollar. So all of the Trump rally in the dollar against the yen has been erased. And, of course, there are other currencies that are higher now than they were when Trump was elected. So it's mainly the stock market where there's been a bunch of false confidence in Donald Trump. And so it's mainly it's that rally that, you know, is kind of his fault. They're not really his fault. Just Wall Street's been able to repackage everything and, and spin it uh, in a positive way. And it, and it got this this market rally. But he was saying, look, it's kind of my fault that this bad thing is happening. But we need the dollar to go down. And, you know, Donald Trump is right only in his assessment that the, uh, the dollar is overvalued because there I agree with him. It is overvalued. But where Trump has it wrong is the way he believes this affects the economy because he thinks it's a bad thing. But in the short run, it is a very good thing. When your currency is overvalued, you get a higher standard of living than you really deserve. You get to consume disproportionate to what you produce. So Americans are enjoying an artificially high standard of living thanks to the overvalued dollar that Trump wants to see lower. Well, if the dollar goes down, it's going to take the American standard of living along with it. Now, of course, in the long run, and I've made this point and so many people don't seem to understand this, in the long run, this is terrible. Because how are we financing these trade deficits with this overvalued dollar? We're borrowing money. We're selling off our assets. We're selling our bonds. We're selling our stocks. We're selling our real estate, which means we have to pay rent to our foreign landlords. We have to pay interest to the foreign holders of our debt. We have to pay dividends to the foreign holders of our stocks. We are trading assets that produce income for consumer goods that evaporate, that rapidly depreciate. This is not a good trade long term. 
We are sacrificing our future to indulge our past, right? And the sooner that we stop doing that, the sooner we begin fixing the problems, but then we have to bite the bullet. Then we have to deal with the economic reality. And it means a sharp reduction in our standard of living. And Trump does not want the voters to have to endure that now that he's president, because now he's going to have to accept the responsibility because he promised instant uh, success. He promised that if we elect him, we're just going to win, 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 right? We're going to win so much, we're going to be tired of winning. We're going to want to lose one on purpose just to break up the monotony of constantly winning, right? And I've always said that that is not the solution. And so Trump doesn't want this. And of course, if Janet Yellen wants to get reappointed, what is going to have to happen? They are going to have to first start to dial back all this rate hike talk, all this we're about to shrink our balance sheet talk and start facing reality that we need to cut rates. We need an economic stimulus, right? They're going to do QE4. Not that we actually need it, but that's their only remedy for what they perceive to be the illness of recession. And I think that is going to be the catalyst for a tax cut. It's not going to be just tax reform. It's going to be tax cutting as an economic stimulus. And nobody can resist that. And again, this is going to be a bipartisan, which means really, really bad stimulus package that is going to include tax cuts for the middle class. There may not be any tax cuts for the rich or maybe minimal tax cuts or maybe a small reduction in the corporate tax. But I think there's going to be tax cuts for the middle class, maybe a payroll tax cut, and it's going to be combined with increases in government spending, mainly infrastructure, but other jobs uh, type programs, which is going to blow a hole in an already enormous deficit. We go into recession and we have tax cuts and increased government spending. Our annual budget deficits could be closer to two trillion dollars a year than the one trillion that we had uh, under Obama. And how is that going to be financed? I mean, we were doing QE3 was $80 billion a month. QE4 is probably going to have to be like $150 billion a month. I mean, it's going to have to be much bigger in order to uh, finance this. And of course, QE1 and QE2, in large part, we had a lot of help from foreign central banks. What foreign central bank is going to want to help now when they're going to be accused of being a currency manipulator? Who is going to want to print a bunch of money to prevent the dollar from falling to load up a bunch of treasuries and then be accused by the Trump administration of being a currency manipulator. So I think the Fed is going to be on its own. I mean, the Fed is going to be the only central bank that's going to be loading up on dollars and loading up on treasuries uh, to finance this massive mother of all QE programs. That is coming. And we'll see. You know, we're going to get some more economic data. And every time we get more data, it's bad data. The only data that was good was all this soft data that was based on confidence, based on people feeling good about Trump having been elected and about all the great things that were going to happen, all the deregulation, all the tax cuts, all the economic growth. All that was pie in the sky. None of that has actually happened. But what is happening is the hangover is already setting in from the massive high from eight years of 0% interest rates and QE it's already happening, right? The economy is already decelerating. The bubble is deflating now, and it is a desperate need of another shot of, of, of air. They're going to have to try to blow it back up again. Of course, it's not going to work, right? But that's what they're going to do. And I think ultimately what is going to happen when the Fed has to go back to rate cuts, when the Fed has to start you know, increasing the balance sheet yet again, all this talk now, people are going to realize that the Fed is just making this stuff up, that it has no ability to do what it's talking about. And I know people are still want to criticize me. Oh, Peter Schiff, you said the Fed couldn't raise rates. And look, they raised rates a couple of times. Yeah, they raised rates a couple of times. And look where GDP is. See, they kept saying, and this is what I believe, they kept saying that the rate hikes were depending on the data. I knew the data was going to be lousy, and I was right. The data is lousy, yet they raised rates anyway, but they barely raised them. And if they have to abort the rate hike campaign and go back to zero, then that vindicates everything that I was saying. Because the fact that they raised them a little bit means nothing if that put us back in the recession, and now we're back at zero. And, you know, by the way, I was on Futures Now again with Scott Nations, and I want to talk more about that too when it comes to gold. But that clown was out there again saying, oh, Peter, you know, you were wrong. You said that QE4 was going to follow QE3. And the point is, yeah, it will. 
I didn't say it was going to happen immediately. I just said that QE3 wasn't going to be the last one, that they were going to do a QE4. And when they do QE4, the fact that a few years you know, went by between QE3 and QE4, it didn't mean I was wrong. The fact that they had to do it again is proof that it didn't work because we're right back in the same hole, only now it's much bigger. So that is exactly uh, where we're headed. Now, even though this was a holiday-shortened week and the stock market is closed today, the market sold off. The Dow was down almost 140 points on Thursday, and it closed near the lows of the day. And I've been talking about this U.S. stock market correction, and I think it's coming, you know, as, uh, you know, the bloom comes off the Trump rose and people start to realize that all the good things that they baked into the stock market cake, uh, you know, are not going to materialize. And this is going to put even more pressure on the Fed, which, of course, is more asset dependent than data dependent. The data they really look at is the level of the stock market. And if the stock market starts to come down, that's what's going to make the Fed nervous. In fact, the Dow is now only up about 4 percent on the year. In contrast, the price of gold, which rose again on Friday, in fact, is up almost every day this week. The price of gold is now almost up 12 percent on the year. It closed about 1288. And if you remember, we had a correction in the price of gold February, March time frame. And on this podcast, I called that correction because I noticed a divergence between gold stocks and the price of gold, where gold was going up and making new highs for about five days in a row, yet gold stocks were going down. And I said, you know, this lack of confirmation is probably forecasting a correction in the price of gold. But I said that I didn't think the correction would be very deep. I thought it would be a shallow correction. And that is, in fact, exactly what happened. The price of gold did correct. Gold stocks continued to fall. And then again, on this podcast, when I noticed the opposite, when I noticed gold making new lows, but gold stocks not going down anymore, I said, I think the correction is over. And I was right. And now we have gold prices at new highs. But you know what? The correction in gold stocks hasn't ended because... I think the GDX would still have to rise about 7% to get back to where it was in February. And I think the GDXJ, which are the junior gold stocks, that index would have to rise, I think, about 17% to get back to where it was in February, even though gold is already higher than it was then. So gold, if you look at the current price of gold right now, it didn't even correct at all because it's at new highs for the year. Yet you still have gold stocks deep in correction territory. And that, I think, is a tantamount to the negativity that there is, how much people just don't believe this gold market rally. After all, hey, the Fed is raising rates. Gold is supposed to go down, right? No. In fact, gold bottomed when the Fed started raising rates in December of 2015. In fact, if you look at the outperformance of foreign stocks, foreign stocks started outperforming. Our strategy started beating the U.S. market in basically December of 2015, January 2016. It was the Fed raising rates that marked the change because for years, the markets were anticipating that rate hike and building all sorts of things into that. And then once it actually happened, you know, buy the rumor, sell the fact. And ultimately, what's going to happen is the fact is not going to live up to the rumor because we're not going to get that many rate hikes. And the Fed is ultimately going to have to cut rates because we're right back in an even deeper recession than the one that we were in before. So the fact that gold stocks are not moving more, I mean, you've got gold stocks are maybe up like 17 percent this year, which is still strong. It's still much more than the Dow and it's still beating the price of gold. But if the price of gold is up 12 percent, you would expect gold stocks to be up maybe 30 percent or more. Now, I think they will catch up. I think we move over 1300 next week, which I think we will. I mean, I think we would be over 1,300 today if gold were trading based on this week retail sales numbers. But let's say we get there above next week. Maybe the resistance then. I said on this podcast very recently, I said that the resistance was 1,260. And I said once we close above it, we're going to move to 1,300 very quickly. And so far, that prediction looks like it's going to pan out. I think there's going to be some resistance at 1,350, though, rather 1,300, rather. I said we get there quickly. Um, but we could get a catch-up rally in these gold stocks. That could be huge. And so you don't want to miss out on that. So I still think there's a good opportunity for those of you who haven't pulled the trigger yet to buy some of these gold stocks. But, you know, let me circle back. Because now that I'm talking about gold, let me go back and talk about uh, Scott Nations and my CNBC Now. So if you haven't actually seen this, it's up on my uh, YouTube channel. So go check it out. It was CNBC.com. So it wasn't actually on television. 
It was just on the internet. You know, I have a hard time getting on actual CNBC, uh, but they put me on the uh, on the internet. You know, I have a hard time getting on a lot of shows. I don't do CNN really anymore. Fox hardly calls me. I mean, so I, I'm not on television nearly as much as I used to be, although I should be because what I'm saying is extremely relevant and people really need to hear it. But in order to hear it, you know, you got to go to the internet. And so I was on the internet with CNBC, and of course they, they bring out Scott Nations again. I mentioned earlier he was making fun of me because I predicted QE4, even though QE4 is exactly where we're headed. And he also made fun of me because he said, hey, Peter, you said the Fed couldn't raise rates, yet they raised rates. And I said, you know, and the fact that they raised them, and I never said it was impossible that they raised rates. I just didn't think they would because I said if they did, the economy is going into recession, and then they're going to have to look like fools when they have to reverse course and cut rates. But that's exactly what's going to happen. They're going to look like fools. They're going to have to reverse course, and they're going to cut rates. Meanwhile, they barely raised rates. There are a lot of people who thought rates would be much higher than this by now. Those are the guys that are wrong. right? If anything, my call of them not raising rates at all is much closer to, to what actually happened than all the people that thought they would have a lot more hikes by now when people were talking about it in 2014 and, and 2015. And also look at what's happened to the economy as a result of the minimal hikes that it, they've already had. I mean, that's exactly what I said was going to happen if the Fed hiked rates, which is why I thought they might have been smart enough not to do it. But again, I overestimated uh, their intelligence. But where Scott Nations really tried to, you know, impugn my integrity was with gold, right? Because he waited for me to mention gold. And the first thing he says, oh, there you go, Peter Schiff. You know, you're just a gold salesman. You're just trying to sell gold. And here you are talking gold. And I'm like, first of all, you know, everybody that comes on CNBC is trying to sell something, including Scott Nations, who claims that he doesn't have anything to sell because he doesn't manage anybody's money. But he does have a business and he does have some index products. He's got some business that he's promoting and he's going on CNBC trying to help it out. But all I know, CNBC probably pays this guy. You know, I don't get paid by CNBC. And, you know, I just go on because, you know, they give me a platform and I want to, you know, get my message out there. He might actually be paid. Maybe he actually goes on CNBC because he needs the money, you know, which is pretty pathetic because they don't pay very much. But I'm sure he's got something to sell. But almost every guest that comes on, from a Wall Street firm. They all are selling something. They're all there. They're not getting paid. They want to get their firm name in the news. They want investors to see the name of their firm. They want to promote the market. They want to promote something, right? Yet I'm the only one that gets accused of being a promoter of trying to sell something when there's nothing wrong with that, right? If I believe that the price of gold is going to go up and I sell gold, I mean, what's wrong with communicating my beliefs uh, over the airwaves? But of course, he makes it act as if gold is the only thing I sell, right? I mean, I'm a stockbroker too, just like all these other stockbrokers. And you know, I just happen to believe that foreign stocks are better investments than domestic stocks, but I'm still out there touting stocks. Yet it's only when I talk about gold that he says that I'm, I'm being unethical. I'm just trying to unload my gold as if, you know, it's my gold I'm trying to sell. I'm still buying gold for myself. I'm just acting as, an, as a go-between. When people buy gold from Schiff Gold, you know, they're not buying my personal gold. I'm, I'm buying it from a wholesaler and selling it retail, right? I'm just making a little bit of a markup. But, you know, if I didn't think people should be buying gold, I wouldn't tell them to do it. In fact, I make less money. When my clients buy gold, I make less money than when they buy stocks. So I'm actually costing myself money when I tell people to buy some gold instead of buying a stock or instead of giving me the money to manage. So I actually, you know, so it's actually not in my interest if I tell people to buy gold instead of buying something where I have a higher markup or I can charge a management fee. But I tell my clients to buy physical gold because I think they should own it. But, you know, he knew I was coming on. So he already, you know, he got some ammunition, right? He went back and he got the numbers and he comes and says, Peter, you know, if you go back to 1989, the return on the Dow Jones since then is like 9% a year, and the return on gold is only 4%. So people buying gold are fools. They're losing money. Your advice is bad. And you know what? What does that have to do with anything? First of all, he cherry picks the year 1989. Right? He doesn't want to go back to like 2000, in which case people are much better off buying gold than buying stocks. But the whole thing is a straw man because I have never claimed that people should own gold at the exclusion of stocks, that people should only own gold and not own stocks. That, those words have never come out of my mouth. I believe that people should have investments. Gold is not an investment. 
Gold is a store of value. Gold just sits there. Gold doesn't generate any income. Stocks are businesses. They generate dividends. And obviously, over a longer time period, stocks are going to outperform gold. Of course, they're going to outperform gold. Now, of course, not all stocks, because some stocks are going to go bankrupt. Companies are going to, you know, are going to fold. But if you take a broad basket of stocks, a broad index, over longer periods of time, and the longer the time period, the more likely you are going to make more money owning income generating businesses than just sitting on a pile of gold. Right. Obviously, that is the case. Right. You're compounding your dividends over time. You're not earning anything on your gold unless maybe you loan it out. But even then, you know, the interest you're going to earn on a gold loan is going to be very low. So I am not against stock investing. But here's the thing that Scott Nations overlooks. Of course, I wish I had said this on on uh, on CNBC. But, you know, it's a live interview. I, you know, I can't think of everything. You only have so much time, which is why it's great to listen to my podcast because you get a lot more information because I have more time uh, to explain. But I would have liked to have educated Scott Nations on air about this fact. And maybe I'll remember it the next time, you know, they bring this guy out when, when I'm on uh, CNBC uh, Futures now. But but over those long periods of time, Right, where stocks outperform gold, there are shorter periods of time where gold outperforms stocks. When is that? It's when stocks become expensive. Right? When stocks are expensive or very expensive, which is the case now, you're better off not buying them. You're better off buying gold instead of stocks. Now, when stocks are cheap, well, then you're better off using your gold to buy stocks. Now, over a long period of time, right, you, you have the cycles, right? Stocks are expensive, cheap, expensive, cheap, and you smooth it out. So, you know, what I tell people, what do I think will make you more money over the next 100 years? Buying the Dow or buying gold? I would bet on the Dow, right? Over the next 100-year time period, I think the Dow is going to outperform gold, right? Even though stocks are expensive today, if you got 100 years to wait, you know, you'll probably be better off. But most people don't have a 100-year time horizon. Now, even 50 years, I'd probably say, okay, over the next 50 years, you're still probably better off uh, from, you know, buying U.S. stocks than buying gold. But over the next year, 10 years, not a chance. Over the next 10 years, I think you're much better off in gold than U.S. stocks. If those are your only two choices, because U.S. stocks are very expensive. They've been expensive for a long time. And if you go back to 2000, and that's already like a 17-year time period. You're still better off, I think, in gold than in U.S. stocks because U.S. stocks were very expensive in 2000. That's the problem. Right now, obviously, if you go back to 2009 when U.S. stocks got cheap, okay, you would have been better off in U.S. stocks than gold, right? But you go back, I mean, if you owned gold in 1970, when stocks were very expensive and gold was very cheap, I mean, even today you still might be better off in gold, even with all the compounding. But clearly, from 1970 to 1990, you were much better off uh, in gold than stocks. I mean, you were way better off in gold than stocks between 1970 and 1980, right? 1980, of course, is when the gold market uh, topped out and the stock market bottomed out. So cyclically, yes, there's going to be times where you're better off in U.S. stocks and there's going to be times that you're better off in gold. But ever since I started coming on CNBC, really, it's been better to be invested in gold than U.S. stocks. Now, for me, my universe is a lot bigger than the Dow or the S&P or the NASDAQ, right? So fortunately, I can look around and look at emerging markets or certain developed foreign stock markets that I don't think are expensive because I would rather own growing companies that pay dividends, right? A portfolio of companies that pay dividends and grow their earnings than a big pile of gold. I mean, obviously, but I want to have some gold as liquidity, right? Because what if everything goes down? I mean, I, you know, even if you can remember when I wrote the book Crash Proof, I recommended a third of the portfolio be in stocks, I had a third in gold and like a third in foreign currencies. You know, I wanted liquidity because I wanted to be able to buy more if the market went down. And that's that's exactly what happened. So you always want to have some liquidity. And I think you want to have that liquidity in gold. And that's where guys like Scott Nations never make the comparison. Because I don't compare gold to stocks. Because stocks are investments that generate returns. I compare gold to fiat currency. I compare gold to the dollar. 
I compare gold to the euro. I compare gold to the yen. And there, the, it's the opposite of stocks, right? The longer the time period, the more gold is going to outperform, right? So if you say, what's going to be, you know, what's going to be more valuable a year from now, you know, a dollar or gold? I mean, I think it's going to be gold. But if you give me a five or a 10 year time horizon, well, then I know it's going to be gold. If you give me a 50 year time horizon, oh yeah, definitely, right? Because the longer the time horizon, the more paper currency is going to depreciate, right? Because if you just take your currency and bury it in the ground, right? You, you don't have any yield on that. Now, obviously, you can take your currency and put it in a bank or make a loan and try to generate a return on a loan. But look how low interest rates are right now. Obviously, there's practically zero return on just holding currency as opposed to the dividends that you can get on stocks. But, you know, U.S. stocks right now, the dividends are very low. So the, what you're giving up in the way of dividends is not very high compared to what you would be giving up if stocks were cheap. When stocks are cheap, yeah, you want to buy them with both hands. But they haven't been cheap for a long time, right? I mean, they were cheap potentially on a, maybe on a relative basis in 2009, but they still weren't really cheap. When they got to be cheap was in 2000, I mean, 1980. I think that the Dow was at maybe seven times earnings. I mean, you had like a 6% or so yield on the Dow, maybe more. I forget the exact numbers, but U.S. stocks were actually cheap. In fact, you could buy the Dow for one ounce of gold in 1980. That was cheap. That was where the Dow was in 1932 when it bottomed out. You could buy the Dow for an ounce of gold. So there are times when the U.S. stock market gets very, very cheap. And I think it's going to happen again. I think the U.S. stock market is going to get very cheap again. And, you know, hopefully I buy it. I mean, I really do. I mean, nothing would make me more proud and more happy than to be aggressively buying U.S. stocks, because that would mean I believe that we have made the right changes. And I have a lot of clients that ask me that, too. It's like, well, when are you going to buy? When are you going to recommend? It's like, well, when we do the right thing, when we finally bite the bullet, when we finally acknowledge the mistakes, right? When we start eradicating the debt, when we start slashing government spending deregulating, when we start doing a lot of things that people thought maybe Trump was going to do, which of course he's not going to do, because there's no political will to do that yet. Things aren't bad enough. But once we actually do the right thing, just like, you know, when you're a drug addict or you're an alcoholic, you don't actually do anything about your problem until you've lost your job, you know, your wife left you, you know, you've lost it all. And now you finally admit that you got a problem and now you check yourself into rehab. Well, we're going to have to do that as a nation and it's going to be painful. And when we do that, believe me, nobody is going to be optimistic. Stocks are going to be tanking. Bonds are going to be tanking. Interest rates are going to be rising. The dollar is going to be in the floor. But I'm going to know right? From all, from the ashes of that will rise, you know, like a phoenix, a free market economy that if we do the right things, if we, you know, dismantle all this government and allow free market forces to work, they will work their magic, right? And the United States will rise again to be an economic power in the true sense of the word. And I will want to participate in that. But I don't even know if that's going to happen. Because, we could be looking at something very different. You know, a lot of people right now are saying, oh, Donald Trump, you know, he, he's the next Ronald Reagan. There's no chance of that. But you know what? He might be the next Jimmy Carter. And, you know, Jimmy Carter came in and, you know, he was an outsider. I mean, yes, he was a governor from Georgia. I mean, that's pretty outside, right, Georgia. And he was only a governor for one term. Now, he was in politics a little bit before that, I think, in the Georgia State Senate. But before that, he was, I think he was in the Navy or the Air Force. And then he was a peanut farmer. And that was what he was known as. Hey, let's bring a peanut farmer to Washington, right? I mean, because, hey, I mean, he's got to be better than these career politicians who wrecked the economy. And the economy was pretty bad when Jimmy Carter came in. I'm sure we had the Watergate scandal. But we had a lot of problems when Jimmy Carter was elected, you know, we had printed a lot of money. We had the, the Great Society programs under Linda Johnson. And so Carter came in and kind of everything fell apart under Carter. But people didn't really appreciate how bad things were until Carter was elected. And then all of a sudden it blew up. And that really laid the foundation for Ronald Reagan because Carter was a Democrat. And it really punctuated 
a lot of big government programs, even under Richard Nixon, because Richard Nixon, even though he was a Republican, he was very liberal. He was, he was Rockefeller Republican. He was, you know, big government guy. And so it really allowed uh, for Ronald Reagan to get elected and the Reagan revolution to begin. So the danger here is that Donald Trump is a one-termer, just like Jimmy Carter. He's elected into a situation which the public doesn't think is that bad or the media doesn't think is that bad. And then it all blows up on his watch. And since he has wrapped himself in a Republican uh, package and talked about deregulation and tax cuts, the opposite of that would be going to a Bernie Sanders type socialist, real big government guy. So if we do that, right, the day that America is going to do the right thing is further and further into the future. Because I am not going to, you know, sell my foreign stocks and sell my golds based on the prospect that we might do the right thing. I want to actually see that we do it, that we pass the legislation, that we make the reforms. And the good thing is doing the right thing in the short run will be so painful economically and politically that it will bring asset prices down even more. Because investors won't understand the opportunities there. And even if they do, they won't have any money to take advantage of it. There's going to be so little liquidity. There's going to be so little buying power. That's when it's going to be so you know, advantageous for us at that point to be able to repatriate all of our foreign assets, to be able to use our gold and our gold stocks to buy substantially depressed U.S. stocks at a point in time where we know the economy is going to recover because we have confidence in the free market. Other people don't. They have confidence in government. They think government works. They believe in the Fed. They believe in all this nonsense. I don't. I know that policy is doomed to fail. I know the only system that works is the free market system. Free enterprise, capitalism have been lifting people out of poverty since the beginning of, of the markets, of free markets, since the Industrial Revolution. In fact, all the advancements that we have made has been because somebody tried to figure out a better way to do something because he wanted to make a buck. He wanted to solve a problem and he wanted to get rich. And so as soon as we recognize that, then we will be able to build a foundation upon which genuine economic growth uh, can result and ri rising living standards can lift all Americans. But we are still a long way away from that. We don't have to uh, plan uh, what we're going to do in the event that that eventually happens. Right now, we still have to buckle up and prepare for this collapse. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, we don't want to buckle up and be in the car when it goes over the cliff. We want to get out of the car because this crash is going to be so bad. If you're still in the car, I don't care how many airbags you have, you're not going to survive. So you got to get out. You got to be in the right portfolio. You got to be in the right markets. You got to be in gold. You got to be in gold stocks. And you got to recognize that the trend is already turned. It's just that this is just the beginning. The gains that we've seen last year and so far this year are just the tip of an enormous iceberg of gains that I see coming in the months and years ahead. Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock-focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to look. Isn't it time you change the channel and let Euro Pacific put a little reality back into your portfolio? If you live in the United States and have $25,000 or more to invest, call 800-727-7922. That's 800-727-7922. Non-U.S. residents access similar strategies through Euro-Pacific Bank at europacbank.com. Euro-Pacific Capital and Euro-Pacific Bank are affiliated companies. Hi, this is Peter Schiff, and long before foreign governments were buying gold, I urged my clients to put 5 to 10% of their portfolios into physical precious metals. Despite gold's massive rise over the last decade, I still think that a 5 to 10% allocation to gold and silver is a smart investment decision. But buyers have to beware. Big TV gold dealers push all sorts of coins that are poor investments. Bait and switch deals, price protection guarantees, leveraged gold accounts. These are just a few of the sleazy tactics used to swindle inexperienced gold buyers. 
My gold company is different. We never offer a coin or bar unless I consider it to be a good investment. I want my customers to be educated. That's why I'm offering you a free research report exposing the biggest scams and ripoffs in the industry. Download my report, Classic Gold Scams, and how to avoid getting ripped off for free at goldscams.com. This report tells you everything you need to know about how to avoid losing thousands of dollars with scam gold dealers. It even tells you how to tell if a salesman is lying to you on the phone. This is a must read for anyone considering a gold or silver investment. Download this free report today at goldscams.com. That's goldscams.com.